Holly Shippers, take it away. Uh, welcome. Uh, I like to start my little classes off with a little history if possible. So here's your history lesson on houseplants. Uh, roughly 2000 years ago, houseplants actually started as outdoor plants that were brought up close to the house or off the kitchen. They were grown for uh, vegetables, herbs, fruits, berries. They were more for um, a necessity. Uh, let's skip to the 1600s uh, where it became um, a new thing to introduce them to the home. I like that fern over there. Why not grow it in the house? Let's try. Uh, let's jump into the 1800s. 1800s really blew it up for house plants. There was a botanist by the name of Nathaniel Ward. He uh, was going to conduct a, an experiment on moths. First he had to create the containment for this experiment. So he created big glass boxes called Wardian boxes or Wardian cases. Um, so he started his moth experiment, neglected it a bit, not a very good botanist, went back to see how the moths were doing. Needless to say, the experiment came to an end, but the ferns were beautiful. So what he had created was something that kept ferns alive without him having to do anything with them for a very long time. So what can he do with these cases? Well, they thought, why don't we see how long plants can go in these cases? And they can go pretty long time, especially these big ones. They went for a few months um, without human interaction. Hmm, why don't we bring some house plants over from other countries? We can bring them by train, we can bring them by boat. And that's what they did. Well, that changes things a bit with the houseplant uh, uh, favoring. Uh, they pay to have them you know, traveled to get, they pay to have them brought over. So what does that mean? Hmm, now I'm gonna have to pay for my houseplants. Houseplants back then became a uh, sign of wealth. Not everybody had that extra uh, few cents to buy a houseplant with. So it became a, a, a status. You were well-to-do if you could afford to buy these plants that came from countries that you may never ever see or have never seen pictures of. Remember, we're in the 1800s. Um, very, very big uh, part of history for house plants. Now these Wardian cases, we call them terrariums today. Um, once in a while, I'll get somebody in that calls it a Wardian case, but uh, we call them typically terrariums now. And the way they work is, um, you've got your soils or your, your plants in a moist soil environment. They draw up the moisture. They expel moisture through their foliage that attaches to the case. It slides right back down into the soil and repeats. So it's kind of a self-sustaining environment. Uh, very, very uh, important for long distance travel, obviously. Um, then we jump into Oh, the 1980s, oh, what an era that was. Uh, people didn't want to do houseplants. They didn't want to bother with them. So it wasn't that popular for the whole 80s. Then we slid into the 90s. Well, I kind of miss my houseplant, but I don't want to bother with it anymore. Okay, how about some fake plants? Well, yeah, it's not the best thing to go, but the 90s went into the fake plants. Then we hit the 2000s and NASA decides, huh, what, uh, what benefits do we have with these house plants? So they conducted an um, experiment on air purification amongst other things. That was the other priority at that time was air purification. Air purification, what's that? Well, that's when your house plant releases toxins into the air, or sorry, releases gases into the air, which reaches out, grabs those toxins, draws it back in, draws it through its um, root system into the microbes of the soil. Microbes are um, pr protozoa, fungi, bacterial, and virus. Um, and it will uh, clean your air. Now, everybody has toxins. These toxins could be formaldehyde, uh, xylene, benzene. You find it in literally your house. The, 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 what your house is built out of, the wood, the wallboard, the paint, the uh, um, uh, stain on your furniture, 
your carpet, your upholstery, your drapes. It's everybody has it. it has nothing to do with uh, uh, not cleaning your house. It's what your house is built of, and what is in your house. Um, very important, you know. Let's get those toxins out of the air. Let's filter them down through the uh, soils. Let's use these plants. Now, you're not going to achieve that with one plant. It's going to require many plants. Um, the bigger, the better. These smaller plants will grow to get bigger. You've just got to start somewhere. So 2010, that's when people are getting more into the, the health of the, the benefits of the house plants. Um, uh, then you um, jump into, uh, uh, well, we talked about the air purification. So you need to decide, okay, where do I want my house plants? Let's see, let's look at the lighting. If you're looking at a corner of your room, typically a corner is gonna be more of a low light area. If you're looking for an area in the middle of your room with some surrounding windows, that would be a medium light situation. Um, little offset from a window would be a br indirect bright light area. Most plants you don't want directly in the window or you can burn them they will burn uh, very easily. That's with most of your plants. Um, so you've decided where you want your plant. Let's see, let's, think, let's talk about temperature. Is your house going to be 65 to 75 degrees? That's where most of them are the most comfortable, um, the happiest, there are some exceptions. Um, there's always some exceptions to, to the rules. Uh, then decide, okay, do I want something that is uh, moderate watering? Moderate watering would be uh, letting the first couple of inches dry out of the soil and the rest would be uh, somewhat moist, not wet, but the first couple of inches would be dry before you water again. Hmm, well, I can do that. Or maybe I water too much. Well, that would be a plant that would require um, more of a, a mo moist plant, a moist situation. Uh, plants that like to stay moist but not sopping wet. Well, you know, I always forget to water. Well, okay, then that would be a situation maybe for a succulent or a cactus where it's uh, required to um, dry completely out, stay, stay dry for a while before you water again. Well, I can do that. I could do that. Okay. Well, let's talk about these soils then. Um, soils for say a tropical plant would be a typical potting soil. The potting soil would have some um, peat moss or uh, uh, cocoa fiber, cocoa core to help retain moisture and some perlite or pumice for drainage. Uh, for your cactus, that would be more extra sand, um, pumice, perlite uh, for good drainage uh, where air can get into it more. Uh, then there would be for maybe African violet. There's African violet, actual Af African violet mix that has a little extra of that uh, peat or cocoa core that helps give it the extra moisture that they do like. Um, and just a quick note, African violets need to be watered from the bottom. And then there would be uh, orchid, orchid bark. So this is not a soil, obviously. It's a, it's a planting medium though. Orchid bark is just what it is, bark. Uh, orchids are epiphytes. Epiphytes live in the crick or the crevice of tree branches. They like the air to their roots. That's why there's holes in these orchid pots. So the air can easily get in there. And these are their roots. So their roots are, are needing that air. They don't do well in soil. Um, for uh, fertilizing, I, uh, you don't want to fertilize your house plants in the fall and winter. You want to fertilize spring and summer. The reason you're not doing it in the fall and the winter is because they need to, they need to go dormant. They need to take a nap. They need to re-energize and save up that energy 
from the spring and summer, putting out all that energy to look beautiful for you and grow bigger for you. So it's very important you don't water in the fall and winter, but do start in the spring and summer. I use a water soluble uh, liquid. We have a very good one called Espoma. And this one's just an all around uh, indoor fertilizer. Um, we also uh, uh, get pests. Pests happen on houseplants. Uh, your most common are gonna be um, uh, mealybug, aphid, spider mites. Uh, unfortunately, you're bringing a, an outdoor plant into a non-cultural area that would make it stress and they get bugs. That's just nature. That's why we have products for bugs. I, I use the three-in-one rose for uh, when the house plants first come to Sunnyside. We do like to do a pre-spray. We want to make sure they're going out on the floor for you, bug-free and happy and healthy. Um, we, uh, let's see. So that's with the pest control. Um, let's, uh, let's start talking about some plants. I'm going to show you some plants and we'll talk about each one individually. Let's start with the ferns. This is a terrace fern, also known as a ribbon fern. This gets a fairly good size. It will get fuller, requires a moist soil. They don't like to dry completely out or they will just turn brown and, and, and go away. They like a nice um, moist so soil and a low light. It's got a little bit, I don't know if you can see that, a little bit of variegation on it. Very delicate. This is a staghorn fern. This is also pet friendly. Hard to tell, it's got a velvety fuzzy foliage there. See if I can get it in the right light. And a fuzzy underside. Staghorns can get a pretty good size. They start to get this collar on them. That collar will turn brown. Don't worry about that, that's okay. I've seen them where they've just been massive. This is a pet friendly fern. That's a staghorn fern. Here we have a rabbit's foot fern. I actually like to call it a tarantula fern. They look like little tarantula legs, little fuzzy roots. Very, very uh, delicate foliage. Likes a moist soil and in indirect low or low light. Little, little uh, rabbit's foot or tarantula. Beautiful, I love them. This one right here is a Boston fern. Here's a smaller one. Boston fern are also pet friendly. You can see they get big. They will get even longer than that. They again like a moist soil and indirect light or a low light. Now ferns and most of your tropicals will want to be spritzed or misted. You can either use a spray bottle, you could use a humidifier in the room, uh, just anything that will give it uh, some humidity. You can also put a tray of water next to it, not, not have it in it, but next to it. Anything to release moisture in the air. This is a Boston fern. Let's see, here we have in my jungle, an elk horn. It's got quite the roughly tip to the foliage. That is an elk horn fern. Moist soil, low light. These are really fun just because they're such a, a different look from what you would think of as, as a fern. That's the elk horn fern. Philodendrons. Everybody likes the philodendron. 
This is called Congo. Very glossy, shiny leaves. They get even larger than this. They get very, very big. This uh, philodendron Congo likes to dry out between watering. If you're starting to get little yellow spots on it with a little brown center, that's from over watering. So let them dry out in between. The Congo philodendron likes a nice indirect bright light. They will get quite large. So you would want a, 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 a for a larger room. This is one of my favorites. This is philodendron Congo. Let's see if we can get you to see all these colors going on. These are the, the buds. And the buds have bright red markings on them. See that? And what it's going to do is it's going to release a bright white leaf. And that leaf will turn into a green and white striped leaf. And eventually into a green, greener leaf. And all this is happening at the same time. This is philodendron birkin. One of my favorites. Oh yeah, I've got favorites. I've got so many favorites. It's going to get pretty good size. It requires, again, drying out between watering and an indirect bright light. Philodendron Birkin. This is the one everybody probably knows. This is the Philodendron Split Leaf. You can see why it's called Split Leaf. They come out like that, so don't panic. It will eventually mature and split. These again get very large. They require drying in between water, indirect bright light. Let's see. Here is a pothos. This is golden pothos. You can see there's a little bit of variegation in there. That's kind of a yellowy creamy color with the green. You can see it is a trailer. Now I've had these uh, in my house where they're right by the stairs at the front door. I have an old 70s house. So if those of you that are my age will know that back then they like to put those windows above the stairs at the main entries. That's where mine would be. And they would get 20 feet across and to the point where you'd be walking in, in them on the stairs. Uh, they do get quite long. Just trim it, clip it back. If it's getting too long, just get under a leaf and clip it back. And when you do that, if you want more, stick it into a cup of water and let it root. And when those roots get about two inches, put it in soil. Now, pothos, if you do that, a pothos would be fine in just a regular potting soil. Here is a Sansevieria, or sorry, Spathophyllum, the other S word. These get quite large. They like a nice moist soil. Uh, in their native uh, land, they, they do grow in running water. It's just much warmer than it is here. Uh, they get much larger. Uh, I have one that's probably close to four feet uh, tall. Um, these you want to be careful around pets. They are toxic. Uh, we uh, had a, a new addition to our family and he right away went to my big one and started chewing on it and kept throwing it up. Very toxic to, to animals. Um, but they are great. I have one in my bathroom where my uh, dog does not go. Uh, they love a low light, moisture, humidity. It's a great, a great bathroom plant. Um, low light. That is a spathophyllum. Oh, here we have another philodendron. This is a chordatum philodendron, also known as a heart, uh, heart leaf, and uh, just a green chordatum. Oh, I guess you want to see it better, huh? So it's just green foliage, kind of a heart shape. This is the new foliage. It's a bit of a, a copy, copper bronzy, uh, can you see that, in color. 
you can see how it's going to start doing a little trailing kind of like that pothos uh, same situation if it gets too big for you clip it under the leaves and root it if you don't want another give it to a friend here we have some uh, pileas. This is silver tree pilea. It's a very deep bronzy with silver striping. Let's see if we can get a close up of its flower. Here, that one is flowering. Not very pretty flower. It kind of is uh, insignificant. You want this more for its, its foliage. This requires um, drying out between watering and an indirect bright light. Uh, they do get bigger. This is just a young guy. This is Pelea silver tree. Here's another Pelea. This one is a Norfolk Pelea. This is a little gray with a little darker veining to it. This one also likes to dry out in between watering. and an indirect bright light, and it's got that same kind of insignificant flower to it. It's more for its foliage, but you know, that silver is quite bright. Here we have a peperomia. This is rugosa. It has a kind of a bronzy foliage on top and kind of a reddish pink underneath. Kind of a cool, shiny plant. This is Peperomia rugosa. This requires drying out between watering and an indirect bright light. Here's Peperomia. This is just a nice variegated Peperomia. It's quite bright green and a cream kind of edge. These get pretty large and they get a spike flower on them. You know, pretty good spike, skinny, really skinny spiky flower on them. Kind of fun to see. They like to dry out in between watering and indirect bright light. Now remember, all these little guys in these little pots, they're going to get bigger. This is a Peperomia ruby glow. Little kind of curled up foliage, green on top, long and narrow, and kind of a, a pinky red underside as well. Now this one's a little bit floppy, but as they mature, they, 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 they get sturdy. Here is a Peperomia, just a nice variegated beautiful pink edge with a variegation. I sure hope you're seeing these colors better than I see on this screen because this is really pretty. This likes to also dry out in between watering and again gets one of those little narrow spiky flowers indirect bright light. It's a variegated peperomia. All right, here's another pet friendly. This is a maranta. This is called a red maranta, also known as a prayer plant. See how it's got the red striping on it? Little uh, chartreuse. Now this is gonna get big and full. It can either be put on a table or in a hanging basket. They like to um, be more moderate watered. Do not put them in a bright area. They will fade and lose their color. Very important because when you buy these, you're wanting it for that color. Pet friendly. That's Maranta, also known as a prayer plant. And there's so many different kinds of Marantas and a lot of them are very hard to come by. These are the more common ones. This is a green Maranta or a green prayer plant. 
So we've got a couple different colors of green going on there. When they start, they're more of a burgundy with green. Right, there's a youngin. Again, the moderate watering, uh, a lower light, do not put it in uh, indirect bright light. Again, you will lose the, the coloration on it. A great for a uh, tabletop or a hanging basket. Again, pet friendly. Aglaonemas. There's a lot of great colorful aglaonemas. This one is aglaonema Siam. See all those colors going on in there? Aglaonemas are very forgiving. They're an easy plant to grow. Um, they're not too picky about whether there's moist soil. They're not too picky about whether they're dry. They're not too picky about the light. Well, the one thing they are picky about is being overwatered. They don't want to stay sopping wet. All kinds of great aglaonemas. And again, this will get much larger. So the, the soil uh, moisture and the lighting, uh, they're more forgiving. They can pretty much do it all. Aglaonema Siam. Here we've got Aglaonema spring snow. You can see where it got that name. It's all dappled with snow. Again, not too picky about the lighting and not too picky about the soil. And it will get much larger foliage wise as well. That is Aglaonema spring snow. Aglaonema ruby ray. Let's see if I can get the colors right. There we go. Those are going to be pink and green and cream. Very colorful. That's Aglaonema ruby ray. Not too picky about the soil, not too picky about the lighting. Let's see. Let's do some crotons. This is a croton oak leaf. See how bright that is? We've got yellows going on. We've got burgundies and reds. Sometimes there's some orange thrown in here. I don't know if you can see that. This has orange edges. There's the oak leaf shape. This is croton oak leaf. They, they do need to dry out between watering. Not stay dry forever though. If they start to droop, then that's saying, hey, I need some water. Croton oak leaf. These get quite large and an indirect bright light would be, it make them happy. I love all those different colors that, that they show. Here is a croton golden bell. It's a variegated. This is also one of my favorites. Look at these little spoons that are coming off of the foliage. See, there's the, the foliage. Whoops, let me get the right one there. There's the foliage. And then there's the stem. And it's still part of the foliage, but I like to call them little spoons. This is cr uh, Croton Golden Bell, variegated golden bell. Again, we've got the... Uh, the reds, the yellows, the pinks, the greens, long, narrow, more of a delicate plant. I have one of these. I love it to death. Oh, and dry out, indirect bright light. Sorry about that. Here we have another croton. This is gold dust. You can see where it got its name. We're speckled with yellow. These get quite large. The foliage will get a little bit bigger, but not too much. The plant itself will get quite large. Let it dry out in between watering. An indirect bright light. This is Croton Gold Dust. This is Croton Petra. 
you can see the theme. They've got lots of color going on with them. This one's got a big broad leaf to it. Likes to dry out in between watering as well as indirect bright light. This will get quite large. Right now, this is nice and light. It's happy as can be. Proton Petra. Anthuriums are fun too. Anthuriums are great for those that are over waterers, but they do not like to be in water, sopping wet. They like to just be nice and moist. They like a nice bright uh, sun. These can be across from a window, not on the windowsill because it can burn, but they do as like as much bright light as they can get. Anthuriums come in a variety of colors. We have them in white, pink, kind of a purpley color. They come in cream, they come in black. Um, they're, they're just long blooming. They bloom for maybe four or five months. They bloom for a very long time. They've got a great big glossy foliage to go with that glossy flower. They, I have seen these massive. These, these can get quite large. Again, moist soil, as much bright light as you can give them. This is an anthurium. This is a uh, calicea, also known as a turtle vine. Very delicate, kind of a, oh, I don't know what color that would be, kind of a ecru. You can see how it's growing as a ball. It just will get to be this big massive ball. You can barely see the pot anymore. Um, they're just a great, great little plant. They like a more moist soil and indirect bright light. Tradescantia also known as a wandering Jew. This one is purple. They also have one that is a red. It's not gonna be bright red like that anthurium flower was, but you can see it's gonna be a more of a redder tone than this purple. They come in all kinds of colors, all kinds of different ones. We have uh, the purple in right now and maybe at one or two of the red. You can see the beautiful striped foliage the purple underside. Let's see if we can show you a flower. They've got these delicate pink flowers. This is just one that's starting to open. Yeah, it's hard to see. Still delicate, dainty pink flowers right now. You can see that they do uh, are a hanging plant. They will get larger. Again, you can clip below a, a leaf area and root in water. Tretiscantia, also wandering Jew. It wants to dry out between watering, indirect bright light. Here's another Tretiscantia. This is Nanook. Oh, that's a beautiful pink. I hope you can see that. Pink and green striped. Tretiscantia, Nanook. It will also turn into more of a hanging plant, like the purple one. Also gets little delicate pink flowers. Dry out between watering and indirect bright light. Try to scan you in the nook. This is a really fun one. It's just hard to see what it can do because it's such a young one. And this one is try to scan you velvet hill. Let's see if you can see it. It's very velvety, very hairy, very soft. Let's see if I back up a bit. Now it's going to do the same thing. It's going to be more of a spiller. The foliage will get larger. Very, very fuzzy. Let it dry out between watering, indirect bright light. Treat it as a hanging plant. Try to scan your velvet hill. Calatheas. 
Calatheas are pet, pet friendly. There are so many Calatheas. There are lots and lots of Calatheas. This one is called Jungle Cat. Some of them have some really fun uh, names to them. This is Jungle Cat. Jungle Cat has a gorgeous pattern on its large leaf with a kind of a burgundy underside. Jungle Cat and the Calatheas in general are pet friendly. This particular one will get quite large. It's gorgeous. They like to be kept moist. Indirect light. And you can see I've got, let's see if it doesn't change here. I've got moss under here. Calatheas love humidity. They like a moist soil. They love humidity and this, this moss collar that we put in helps keep that humidity up. That's Calathea jungle cat. Here's another gorgeous one. This is Calathea dotty. Let's see if you can see that beautiful pinky purple color to it. A great pattern on the foliage. See if you can see that. Pet friendly. Well, of course, we'll get larger. These are just little babies. They have, they, we just got them in, so they don't have their moss collar yet, but they will get them. Calathea dotty. Moist soil, indirect bright light. This is Calathea lancifolia. I like to call it the leopard. Calathea because it just looks like leopard spots to me. Quite spotty. Has a little burgundy pink underside to the foliage. The foliage will get longer, so you'll have really long foliage. The plant, of course, will get larger. Moist soil, indirect bright light. This is Calathea lancifolia. Calathea Mikeana, another great pattern on the foliage. This has kind of a bronzy with a little bit of a burgundy tone under the foliage. You can see it's more of a sturdier stem than a lot of them. Moist soil, indirect bright light, and you know that moss color helps. If you've got some of these and you're wondering why they're turning brown on the tips, that's because they're not getting the humidity and the moisture that they need. Um, big difference when you put the moss collar on. Calathea Mikeana. And I'm just showing you a small handful. There are so many Calatheas in the world. This one is Calathea Conchina, also known as Calathea Freddy. Good old Freddy. Freddy has a beautiful striped foliage, a couple of two tones of green, kind of a ruffle to its foliage, a little bit of a ripple. Moist soil, indirect light, Calathea Kachina or Freddy. Calathea Ornata. This will be the last Calatheas. I'm not going to show them all to you, but I do have quite a few. Calathea ornata. It's got kind of a greeny bronze foliage to it with a pink stripe. Kind of a deep burgundy underside. Moist soil, indirect light. Calathea ornata. Let's do something fun. Let's do some carnivorous. This is a Nepenthes. Nepenthes are carnivorous plants. They're going to produce a, a, um, a juice inside, let's call it, that will draw the um, bugs in and it will digest them. It will dissolve them and digest them. Uh, they like a moist soil. They can take some indirect bright light. You see these are little, little cups with little lids. And they produce that nectar inside there where the, the bugs will climb down into it. 
they're really fun. They're great, great plants. Nepenthes. Here I have a carnivorous bowl. This carnivorous bowl has Venus flytraps. See if you can see those. Venus flytraps have little, like, they look like teeth. They will produce um, the nectar in the little opening there, the little mouth. The bug will climb in, it will close up over it, and it will continue to digest it. It's a Venus flytrap. Now here we have a Saracenia. Saracenias will have its nectar inside here. The bug will climb down through there, through the opening, and, and be drawn to the nectar, and then it will be digested there as well. They like a nice, moist, boggy situation. Um, they like an indirect bright light. The moisture is very important for these. The Venus flytrap is pet friendly. Now this is something I want to show you. These are very hard to find. So I, I could only find two inch, but I had to have them. It's hard to tell. They have, they're very beautiful as a full mature plant. This is an Apicia, very velvety. They come in all kinds of colors. Oh, it's so soft. Has a great pattern on it. It's green with kind of a, a coppery bronzy pattern. They come in, there's so many different kinds of apicias. Here's an apicia that, that we are actually rooting on. This one's called chocolate soldier. And they're just a great plant. They like to um, be moderately watered, indirect bright light. That is an apicia. If you find one, get it. Here's a Hoya. This is a Hoya carii, also known as a sweetheart Hoya. They like to dry out between watering, but not stay dry. If they stay dry, they're going to kind of waffle or pucker, and they don't always come out of that. This is a Hoya carii. Just a little heart-shaped guy. All right, over here some fun succulents. This is a string of dolphins. Let's see if we can see the dolphins. See all those little, little jumping dolphins there? Those dolphins are all up and down this strand. See little dolphins. String of dolphins likes to be uh, very dry between watering. And a, an indirect bright light. Now keep in mind when these plants dry out, you want to make sure when the time to water, when you do water them, that you're not just watering quickly because that's just going to run out the between the dry soil and the, the pot. It's not going to get into the, um, the soil. Even though these like to dry completely out, when you do water them, they need to be totally saturated. And then from that stage, let them dry completely out again. Here we have string of pearls. Same thing with the watering and lighting. Let them dry completely out, but saturate it when it's time to water. These are all little pearls. These will get very long. If uh, for any reason your pieces fall off, you could just lay them on top of soil and they'll sprout again. String of pearls, dry soil conditions, and indirect bright light. Here's an Echeveria. This is uh, Echeveria polydonis. Echever this particular one has kind of a gray foliage. Let's see if you can see the little tips are kind of a peaky burgundy. Yeah, it's hard to see, isn't it? They have a great rose shape to it. They do get larger. These are uh, like, they, they are succulent. They like a dry, Soil condition, I just say dry for a little bit. And then indirect bright light. This is 
uh, Echeveria pelodonis. This one's Echeveria black prince. He's a little dark guy there, a little beautiful coloration. You're gonna see the black is around the edge and the inner part of the leaf is green. It's a beautiful Echeveria called Black Prince. Let dry completely out, indirect bright light. These are great in just bowls with mixes of different kinds of, of succulents. They're really great plant. This is a burrow's tail. Burrow's tail is gonna get long, it's gonna hang. You can use it as a hanging plant. Yeah, let's use your imagination. You can get some burrow's tail looks out of there. Let it dry completely out, indirect bright light. This one is pet friendly. That's a burrow's tail. All right, we've got some Sansevierias, also known as mother-in-law snake tongue. Somebody didn't like their mother-in-law much. This one is Zelanica. You can see that wavy stripe on it, two-tone green. They do get quite large. They do um, take, this particular one can take a lower light or a bright, indirect bright light. Uh, in the lower light, it might turn a little more green on you. Uh, likes to dry completely out, stay dry for a while, and then um, water. When you can water, saturate the soil and repeat the drying process. This is Sansevieria zelanica. So here's another Sansevieria. This is Laurentia. This one's got more of a yellow to it. Again, let the soil dry out, indirect bright light. This you want to have in indirect light, bright light and not low light. You're obviously buying this because you want that yellow, that brightness. If you put it in a low light, it's just going to turn to green. Sansevieria Laurentii. Okay, here's a different Sansevieria. This is Boncel. You can see how it kind of goes and it's going to keep growing that way. It'll get bigger. It just kind of grows like a fan. Let that uh, dry completely through. Indirect bright light. Sansevieria Boncel. Here's another one, Sansevieria Cylindrica. Oh, you can see why it gets that name. It's going to be very upright. Sansevieria cylindrica likes uh, uh, dry soil, indirect bright light. They do get taller, they do get bigger. Sansevieria cylindrica. Here's a fun one. This is actually a euphorbia. This is Medusa's head. It's all twisty. You can see the bright green new foliage kind of gives you the idea of snake heads, if you're familiar with who Medusa is in the mythologies. That's Euphorbia, Medusa's head. Likes to dry completely out between watering. Indirect bright light. I wish you could see the full beauty of this with the lighting. It is gorgeous. Euphorbia Medusa's head. Okay, let's get into some Dracaenas. This is Dracaena mar marginata. This particular one has long skinny green leaves with a red edge. Dracaena marginata can take a dry soil. It does need to dry between watering. Again, if this gets the yellow with the brown spots, that means it's overwatered. If it gets too big, these will get big. If it gets too big, you can, you can cut it to the height that you want it. You can see where this has been cut. Right there, it has sprouted three branches. 
So these are manageable. I have all kinds of different kinds of dracaenas in my house. I have a cathedral roof, so they are allowed a good amount of height, but eventually it hits that, that curve and starts growing up the ceiling at an angle. I have to get in there and take a few feet off of them every couple of years. This is a dracaena marginata. This can also take a low light or an indirect bright light. A lot of your green Dracaenas can take that lower light. Um, if you go for this Dracaena, this is lime, lemon lime, it's going to obviously need a indirect bright light because of that yellow. It can grow in the low light, but it'll turn green and you're, you're, you're buying this probably for that bright yellow color. Dry out in between watering for this one as well. Indirect bright light. That's a beautiful one. Dracaena white stripe, obviously for its white stripe. We'll get good size. This is just a youngin. Dry out completely between watering. Indirect bright light. Again, even though this is white and not yellow, you want to keep it in the indirect bright light rather than a low light or it will green up on you. Dracaena white stripe. Now you saw that all the Dracaenas I was showing you was spiky. Well, this is a Dracaena too. It's not very spiky, is it? It's more leafy. This is gold dust. Dracaena gold dust. See where it gets that little yellow speckling, little, little gold dust all over its foliage? It'll grow kind of in a shrubby form. Likes to dry, dry out between watering. If you start seeing the foliage nod, I call it nodding, that's drooping, that means it's thirsty. But it does want to dry out between watering and in direct bright light. Here's the little, it's starting to get ready to bloom. There's a, a bud, that's the flower bud right there. Here we have ficus. This is a burgundy ficus. It's called that for its burgundy foliage. Uh, also known as burgundy elastica uh, ficus. Elastica is, is because they are commonly known as a rubber plant. This is ficus elastica burgundy. They get quite large. You wanna be careful with these. If they break, they get a white sap. Ficus elastica burgundy. Here's another great ficus. This one has a beautiful variegation on it. This is ficus tanniki. It's kind of a gray blue foliage with a little, little green, a little pink stripe vein. I don't know if you can see the coloration there. This is the new bud, it comes out pink. Yeah, it's got a pink underside. So there's a lot of color going on this one. Again, gets very large. See the pink maybe there. Gets very large, has that sap if it gets broken. Let dry completely out in direct bright light. This is Ficus elastica tenneke. Here's some that you're probably more familiar with. This is um, Ficus benjamina, also known as a weeping ficus. You can see how it just kind of weeps as it, as it grows. Little tiny leaves. This one is very finicky, does not like drafts, does not like being relocated. Uh, if you get one and you get it home and it starts to drop leaves right away, it's just stressy. Um, just continue with it as you would um, normally with letting dry completely out between watering and indirect bright light and it will start flushing out again. They are very, very picky, but they are beautiful in a house. That's Ficus benjamina. This one is Ficus benjamina as well, but this is a variegated Ficus benjamina. This too needs to dry completely out between watering 
an indirect bright light will get big. They do get very big. Variegated ficus benjamina. Okay, here is another ficus. This will be the last of our ficuses. This is fiddle leaf. See, it's kind of the shape of a fiddle. Very glossy, very thick, shiny leaves. These get very large. They're very prunable. I quite often with mine have to cut it down, which is, you know, it, it makes it flush out too. It gets it big. I, I like mine to get to a certain height and then I'll just give it a pruning. They like to dry completely out in between watering and um, indirect. Well, they like a lot of light, but not, I had one in a window in a Southwestern window. It did pretty good. It didn't really burn. So this can probably take more of, of closer to a window than more indirect offset from a window. Um, the more the light, the better. They are very happy in a bright light situation. Fiddly ficus. Here's an aerobica. This is a coffee plant. They make great house plants. They like moisture and they like a low light. If they're in a, a bright light, they are not happy. They, they need to be in a low light and moisture. Um, I would get mine to flower and produce coffee beans by pruning it. It seemed to always want to do that after it was pruned. This is a aerobica or coffee plant. Moist soil, low light. They do get big too, but they are very prunable. Now here's a, a plant for the person who doesn't do well with watering. This is an aspidistra, also known as a cast iron plant. They can take moisture, they can take drought, they can take shade, they can take light. They're like the aglaonema, not so picky. The only thing that will make them picky is being in being too wet. Now this likes to be in a rock, let me get it in my hand, a rock soil mixture. It likes a lot of, a lot, I've got a lot of lava rock in, in, in this. This is one that I've uh, propagated, I've uh, divided it up and put it into pots because the uh, the original plant was just pushing out of its pot and it needed to be re re redone. Uh, Aurelia. Here's a, a little false Aurelia. See how skinny and frilly that is? These can get massive. Now these um, like to have moisture on the top. You know, when you water, you water through, but when the top starts to dry, so moderate watering, then you want to water again. They do not like a draft. They will start dropping their leaves immediately if they are near a draft. Um, but they do like a moderate uh, watering with indirect bright light, and again, they get massive. Now, we talked a little bit about um, propagating, I, I just showed you what I was doing here. Now this is the uh, Apicia. It's getting roots on it now. When those roots are about two inches, I'm gonna put that in soil and that's gonna grow a new plant. It usually takes a few weeks for them to get their roots um, the, big enough. Now this one is an aglaonema that we've just started. Let me not drip over the laptop. Let's see if you can see that. Get it in the right angle. There's little white nubbins, little white buds. That's where those roots are going to start pushing through and get larger. Now, this is a zigzag cactus that I just put in before the class started, but they're so cool. I just want to show you the foliage. That eventually will sprout and we'll plant that up. This is a uh, a little fiddle ficus. It's like the fiddle leaf, but it's a smaller foliage. And you can see that's getting ready to push some roots out as well. So, you know, we, we kind of have fun in the back of house plant department. And this is a Swiss cheese. 
And they've got the little nibbins on there too. This one's got a root. Oh, it's about an inch, an inch in length right there. So it's got a little bit more time before it goes in the soil. Um, just a quick uh, few more that are pet friendly. This is a ponytail stump, a ponytail palm. It's called a stump because they've cut it and made a stump out of it. And these are all different branches, kind of like that Dracaena I had shown you. Ponytail stump will store its water in this bulbous area of the trunk. So they can stay dry for a very long time before watering. Very pet friendly. Um, indirect bright light. This is a ponytail stump. Spider plant, another pet friendly. A couple different kinds of variegations. This one's got more of a white to green variegation. We also have one that is uh, more of a green with a white variegation. You can see how it's growing. It's going to be more of a hanging plant. They like to dry out in between watering, indirect bright light. If you overwater, they start to turn brown. This is a spider plant. Very pet friendly. This is an aloe vera. Now, not all aloe, aloe are going to be pet friendly. This one is an aloe vera. I also use it as a medicinal. It's great for skin irritations. I um, personally myself drink it each morning, two ounces each morning, but there is a way of processing. So I purchase it, I don't make my own. This is an aloe vera. Let dry completely through between watering and an indirect bright light, they get quite large. I have four of them at home that are now four feet tall. Um, they're so happy that they bloom for me twice a year. And I cringe when they bloom because that means they're gonna put out about 15 babies each. And I have a grow room full of aloe vera. <laughs> my, my friends and neighbors know where to come when they, when they kill theirs and eat another one. That is very pet friendly. And another one to show you would be the maiden hair. Very dainty, very delicate. This one does not like to stay as moist as other ferns. It will start uh, rotting. And this can take a little bit more of a light than most ferns. It can also take the indirect low light, but it would be ha happier with the indirect bright, but not in a hot window. It would not like that. It just wants to be in more of a, a, a brighter situation than most ferns. It's a maidenhair fern, also pet friendly. Okay, any questions? So thanks for hanging with us, everybody. I know we've gone a little bit over, but as you can tell, we love plants and there's so many to talk I about. keep going and going. <laughs> right, and we've only covered, you know, the surface of it. So, um, and we've had a lot of questions, a lot of good dialogue through the chat. So we're gonna do our best to get through these questions, but if for some reason your question doesn't get answered or it pops up later, we would love to chat with you. You can give us a call here at the nursery or send us an email, sunnysidenursery at msn.com. Um, we're happy to, I know some of you have had specific issues with diagnosis and how to fix. Holly's happy to email, you know, chat with you and to get those things worked out. Um, and, you know, we love to talk about plants, so we'd happy to discuss things with you. Um, before we jump into questions, I did want to let everybody know, in case you start kind of needing to go and drop off, that we are offering a discount for all of you that attended to class today. Starting today through next Friday, the 15th, we're offering 20% off all of our houseplants in, in the nursery, as well as all of our indoor pottery for the houseplants. Um, so that'll last a whole week. Just make sure you tell the cashiers when you're here that you were part of the class and they'll get you that discount. Um, and again, we are recording the class. So if you have to leave for some reason, um, you can check back in with the recording and check some of these answers because I know a lot of you have the same questions. So we're gonna do our best to get through all of these um, and do them kind of in the order that they came in. So Ms. Holly, I know you talked about- in. Huh? I said, just keep in mind, we got a big houseplant pottery order in. Lots of new stuff. Yeah, brand new stuff, really good looking pots too. I gotta take some home too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I know you talked about pests 
and bugs and stuff, but um, can you tell us again quickly the little black gnats or flies that live in the soil? What's the best way to get rid of those and then other soil bugs? For the gnats, you want to use a systemic. This is a granular systemic and you'll put this in the uh, soil. And what it's going to do is it's not going to kill the ones flying around. It's going to kill the eggs that they laid in the soil. And the ones that are flying around have about a nine day lifespan. So you just, if you keep after, you know, nine, 12 days, you see some more flying. Uh, you just keep up on, on this until you stop seeing them flying. Now those, those fungus gnats are caused from moisture. So uh, maybe the plant's being overwatered or it just happens to be one that likes moist um, uh, soil. So, you know, like I said before, it's nature, nature gets buggy. So a systemic is, is great for that. Um, we're gonna jump around. I'm just gonna do them in order that they came in. So we're gonna kind of be a little scattered. How do we, how do we know when it's time to change the houseplant soil or when it's time for them to move up to a larger pot? Well, quite often they become what we call root bound. And when they become root bound, depending on what the plant is, it's either going to just push against the, the, the walls of the pot, or you'll just see that all you're seeing is roots and no soil anymore. Uh, that's time to pot them up. Uh, you wanna go, for example, this one, if it was pushing a Against this, you would want to go to a pot no bigger than this. If you're going, if you, oops, sorry, if you go too big, if you go too big, you're creating a lot of extra moist soil and you don't want to do that, especially for those who require a drier situation. So you kind of go the next size up, up in pot. Don't start from this size and also go to this size. Excellent. What about, uh, can you talk a little bit about drainage holes in the pots versus, you know, um, like putting a nursery pot into a cache pot that still has drainage holes, but it's a little bit different? Drainage is very important for plants. Um, if you have a tray, which most of you do, this is an attached one. So it'll drain out of the side and fill up this pot. Now, if you have a plant in a pot like this that uh, likes to dry out in between watering, then when you water all the way through, let it sit in the water that's in here for an hour or two until it wicks up what it needs. And if you're in a situation where you can tip it out into a sink or a bathtub to get the excess water out, then do that so that it gets the chance to dry out. Um, or I, I have some massive pots. I uh, put paper towels to sop it up. Uh, for the um, uh, pot that's just being put into a non-hole pot, you wanna make sure that you're not watering in that pot because that water has no place to go except for back up into the soil. And again, if it's a pot that has to dry out, it's not going to be allowed to. So in a situation like that, you want to take the pot out, put it in the sink or in a bowl, or depending on the size of the pot, and water then and let, let that drip. I, I let it wick it up, and then I'll put it on a paper towel and blot it, and then put it back in a pot like that. Excellent. Um, what about... Can you, uh, there's a lot of questions about bringing some of your house plants outside for the summer. And then, you know, basically how do you go about the transition out and then more importantly back in to make sure that you aren't bringing pests back in? Well, most plant, most of the house plants can handle um, about 55. So you want to watch your nighttime temperatures and there are some exceptions. Some won't, won't want to be that cool. So you kind of have to, ask us about the plant and see if it can take, you know, 55 or it needs to be more like 60, 65. Um, and unfortunately, you're going to probably bring in pests when you bring them back in. Um, I, I would do pre-sprays with something with neem in it possibly to help prevent as many bugs as possible. 
Now, if it's something that's flowering, you don't want to get neem on the flowers. If you feel that you need to do the foliage, I take a gloved hand and I cover the flower and spray the foliage that way. So pre-spraying can help, but don't be surprised if you bring bugs in. Kind of on that same note, how should we clean plants when we bring them home from the store or nurseries? How do we, what do we do? Well, there's a product called Shine. You can use that, but I like to go a step further. I use products that have neem in them. Neem is from a neem tree. It's the oils from a neem tree. So it helps prevent bugs. It helps to kill bugs. And it also can shine the foliage. So I like to do more than just shine the foliage. I want to help prevent those bugs. I haven't had bugs in my house for over 20 years. That's impressive. And you want to make sure you're, you're regularly cleaning that foliage so that those uh, gases can get out into the air and draw the toxins in. You talked about fertilizers a little bit, but is Osmocote uh, something that you can use on your house plants as a slow release? I am an organic grower. Osmocote has been used on plants, but I prefer giving them a little more uh, nutritional value than Osmocote can do. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not putting Osmocote down at all. It definitely can be used. I prefer using organics. If a leaf is turning brown or black at the tip or at the edges, is that a typical sign of something? Yes. Any kind of discoloration is telling you there's something wrong. Now, if that was happening to the spider plant, that would mean you're overwatering. Um, in a lot of cases, it means that you're underwatering. In all cases, it means it's a watering issue, whether it's over or under. And you would know if you're over or underwatering. If you are, haven't watered something for months, then chances are it's a plant that can't go that long. <laughs> um, what about leaves that tend to fall off and kind of systematically as they fall off, they're kind of going up the stem? Uh, again, it depends on the plant. If it is the Benjamina ficus, they can do that uh, either from drafts, from relocation, or from overwatering. So you kind of have to assess the situation and see what it might be. Um, again, call or, or email us if you have these questions and, and let us know more about what's been going on with that plant on if it's been moved, watered, overwatered, um, underwatered. And we can kind of find the reason why it's doing that. Excellent. Um, let's see. Fungus gnats, what's the best product to get rid of those? That would be that systemic. Um, we had some questions about the pothos care specifically. Um, can you kind of recap on, you know, care tips and conditions for those? The pothos can, there's all kinds of different pothos. Um, they like to uh, dry out slightly between watering. They can easily rot. You want to be careful of too much moisture. They can take an indirect bright light, and I've had some of mine in um, a, a medium light. Um, they're not happy too dark. Okay. And again, they can get very long. If they get too long, just clip them below a leaf. Um, after orchids are done blooming, do you cut them back? What do you do? What's the care? After an orchid is done blooming, you've got these nodes here. Let's see if you can see it. Right here. And right here. Now this would be too short. I would clip it up above this one. And then orchids, when they're done blooming, that is when you uh, start fertilizing them and keep them in a lower light. Okay, what about, um, we've had a lot of people ask that their plants start to kind of decrease in health in the winter months and what are some good tips to help um, you know the light obviously isn't as bright in the winter should they use a humidifier what's the best way to help your plants kind of thrive in the winter the first thing i would ask is have you been fertilizing spring through summer and if so with what then the next thing would be how has the watering been going has that has it 
been overwatering and you've had to uh, bring them out of the stress of that? Has it been underwatering, having to be brought out of the stress of that? If they're continually stressing and not being fertilized, they're going to go dormant and they're going to be so exhausted with lack of energy that they're going to not look so good. Okay. Um, when propagating, do you want a good solid two inch on the roots before you put them into soil? Absolutely. You need to have enough root to draw up that moisture. Are there any plants that are pest resistant? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> We wish. Even the, mo even the most toxic can have pests. <laughs> Great. We Just wish. remember, it's all nature. <laughs> um, and when you're, sorry, back to when you're propagating, do you, how often do you need to change that soil? Or, I'm sorry, the water. The water, I, I don't like to change it too much. Uh, if it's straight from tap water, um, you know, it, it just needs to be in it for about two to three weeks, depending on what the plant is. Uh, if it's something that takes a little longer to root, you can use distilled water or keep um, tap water out 24 hours before you change it into that. That'll eliminate the chlorine and all that. Um, somebody asked about, they have some, they said money trees and ponytail palms. Do they both like moist soil? Now the ponytail palm, this is the stump one. There's also one without a stump. Uh, it likes to dry out in between watering. Now the bulbous part is what's going to retain moisture. So they can go quite a while without water. Um, and the, what was the other one? The money tree. Oh, well, there's different money trees. So it depends on which one. If it's the Pakura, which is kind of like a, a, a fingered leafy plant, on a, uh, usually you see it on a braided stem uh, that likes to be moist, that grows in a moist uh, area in its native land. If it's an Aurelia uh, Fabian stump, um, that likes to uh, let it dry a couple of inches on top, moderate water, and then water again. Um, there's like five different money plants, so it depends on which one you have. What's a general indicator if a plant's not getting enough light? Uh, depending on the plant, if if it's one like the Dracaenas with the yellow and it turns green, it's not getting enough light. Uh, if it's trying to bend towards the light, it's not getting enough light. Um, yeah, it just depends on the on the plant. And we had somebody ask in terms of light, uh, they have specifically an aglionema that seems to be growing kind of sideways instead of straight up. And even when they turn it to kind of reposition it to the light, it still doesn't seem to correct itself and grow straight up. Is there anything that they can do to help? Uh, is it truly growing that way or is it flopping? Uh, they can flop if they're too wet because it's starting to rot the roots and there's nothing holding up. So first check that. Um, if, it's, if it's pretty solid in there and not floppy, uh, try to move it closer to, to brighter light. And are aglionemas uh, pet friendly? They're not. No, okay. Um, if you are gonna take leaves off, is there a difference between pulling the leaf off as opposed to pruning it? Is there? You give it a good clean clip. Clip, okay. Yeah, good clean pruning. And this is a this is an aglaonema we have started in our little rooting jar. Somebody asked what your opinion is of uh, glass watering bulbs in houseplants. Are you familiar with those? I don't care for them. Uh, you cannot control the water with them. Uh, quite often, when people have certain issues. Um, and I'll ask, do you have these watering gloves? Because they'll give me some sort of, oh, I just got back from being gone for a week or two. Um, and quite often they'll say they do. They, you cannot regulate the water. They're just going to keep making the soil wet. Gotcha. Um, we've had some questions about wandering Jews, that they've been a little spindly um, or not as full as people would like. Is there a way to help that or prevent the spindly? You can also give them a little pruning and that will make them want to flush out more. 
Okay, um, carnivorous plants. What if you don't have any insects to feed them? Uh, then you can give them little, little, uh, little mealy worms. You can go to, um, you know, I used to go, I had an iguana and there was a pet store down the street that had live food. You can get, or you can give them fish food, just a little container of the flakes. And um, pitcher plants, is there a way to help encourage, uh, somebody's had some of the pitcher, the actual like flower part of it falling off and they're wondering, is there a way to help get more of those to grow? Um, do they fertilize it since it's not, you know, doesn't have any pitchers right now? What do you do? Well, that that's that's kind of uh, it's flower. Um, it will have a time, and then they'll turn brown and dry up and fall off, and then they will get them again. Um, a snake plant that has yellowy white roots is that something to be concerned about? Yellowy white roots. Is that what you said? Say that again. Yellowy white roots. Yes. Um, I would have to see what the problem is and, and are they seeing them coming out from the holes or do they have it out of the pot? Where are they seeing yellowy white roots? I don't know. So if you're still here and you have that question, shoot us an email and we'd be happy to continue that. Discussion. And if you can uh, take a picture, that helps. Um, what about little white bugs? Um, what are those, the ones that are usually in your soil? White bugs? Uh, are they crawling? Are they flying? Are crawling. they just in, in place? Crawling. Uh, again, again, let's take a take a picture and send it so I can see what it is. Otherwise, I'll just be playing the guessing game. <laughs> um, do you have an organic recommend recommendation for scale? For scale? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, um, you can either use, uh, where is it? The jacks. See, it's got the little indicator for organics, if you can see that. You can use that. Um, I have actually used rubbing alcohol in a Q-tip. Um, what about a spider plant that's only had one shoot? Um, it's not really producing. Do you have any recommendations for that? Um, I would fertilize if you're not fertilizing. It, it, it might need to be fertilized. How do you take care of poinsettias after the holidays? Same way you do while they're there for the holidays. Um, they don't want to dry completely out. They don't like a draft. Uh, fertilize when needed. So just the same way you would take care of it while you have it for the holidays. Gotcha. Are staghorn and elk ferns better in pots or should they be mounted? I've seen them happy both ways. So that's up to you on the look that you want. They do just fine both ways. Uh, keep in mind that they are an epiphyte as well. So they do need to have air access to their roots. Um, I have seen them in containers that are um, like, I've, I've seen one very <clears throat> large, excuse me, in a five gallon container that had holes put through the container like a like an orchid pot has holes. But just remember they need uh, the air to their root system because they are epiphytes. If dead leaves fall off of a plant and on top of the soil, are they okay to stay there or do they need to be removed for the soil nutrients? It depends on why they fell off. If they have um, a fungal issue, then you want to remove them. Uh, I remove Move them anyway, just because I don't like the mess that they that they have. Uh, but definitely, if they have a fungal issue, and that's why they're falling off. Um, fiddle leaf figs. What's the best soil ratio to use for them, or soil conditions? Uh, I have several fiddle leaf uh, figs. I have them anywhere from a cactus mix to a 50/50 cactus mix and potting soil. Can older orchids live outside? Um, like for over the winter? Not, not, not if it's a Phalaenopsis or one that is considered a, a non-hardy for here. They will not survive over the winter, but if it's uh, out during the warmer temperatures of our summer, absolutely. Uh, now we do have orchids that are hardy for here. They're not going to look like the Phalaenopsis. They're called Blatilla. And 
they have an orchid-like flower and there's different varieties of those. The edges of a monstera leaf are starting to get lighter. Do you have any ideas on what that could be? Again, it depends on if uh, it's overwatering or if it's lacking nutrients. And I would have to see how it's formed to determine what the issue is. So if you want to take a picture and shoot it off to us, we can take a look. Okay. Um, somebody asked about kind of um, homemade, I don't want to say homemade fertilizers, but other things that you can add to your soil, specifically uh, like tea leaves. Is that something that works or coffee grounds, anything like that? That's for if you want to create something acidic. So if you want to create an acidic soil, you can definitely do that. If you're trying to create a, uh, a systemic uh, that might work on certain things. In the old days, we made tobacco tea and sprayed the plants with that. So if you're using it for that situation, it, it might might work. Um, uh, if you're using it as, you know, uh, a fertilizer, it's just to create uh, acidic soil for that, that part of it. Um, there's always some issues with succulents that like to go, they grow up and then they become too heavy and they kind of start leaning over. Is there a way to help get it to go wider as opposed to just keep going up? You would have to, depending on which kind it is, you can prune it and it can bulk up. But yeah, I want to keep in mind that depending again what it is, where you prune is going to scab over, but eventually, again, depending on what it is, the foliage can come through and, and you know, become sturdier and kind of hide that. Gotcha. A lot of things, if you prune them, it wants to force them from the roots or it'll force them from uh, where you clip it. Again, it depends on what it is you're, you're doing. Um, I know you talked about kind of moss on top of the soil, a moss collar, but how can you tell in terms of how wet your soil is, you know, those that like the moister soil, how do you, with the moss collar, how do you make sure that it's getting enough water, it's as wet as it needs to be? Um, depending on how big your plant is, if it's the one that you can lift or get your fingers in, if it's feeling damp, then you're fine. If if it's feeling really wet, then that's too much water. And then you kind of get a feel of how often you're, you need to water that particular plant in the environment that you've created for it. Do you have any tips on uh, prayer plants? Uh, most of the prayer plants, and it's not all, but it's definitely the two that I showed you today, the red uh, prayer and the green prayer, um, they need to be in a lower light or you lose the color coloration and typically you buy those for their coloration and don't be shocked if in the corner of your eye they go boop at night time <laughs> they go they, they move <laughs> okay I think we've gotten most if not all of the questions but like I said if something comes up or we didn't answer your question or specifically the way you wanted we'd love to hear from you directly so we can chat with you um, we really appreciate everybody joining us for our very first class of 2021 it's very exciting Exciting. Thank you for spending your morning with us. Um, and we hope to see you all around the nursery or hear from you through phone or email. Um, our next class is next Saturday. We're doing a pruning with Trevor. So we hope to see you. It's at 10 o'clock next Saturday. Again, everything's up on our website on our classes page so you can get more information. Um, thanks again for joining us and we'll see you later. Bye. Bye, -bye.